Hi, thanks. We're super happy to be here at CogX and this hybrid of digital and in-person is, is really quite fascinating. So excited to see how this goes and really happy to be here uh, with my colleague Al Capitel, uh, who will uh, introduce herself and uh, the work that she's doing in just a moment. Uh, so before we get to Alka, uh, who you'll you're, you'll hear lots from today, um, I'll tell you a little bit about my background and uh, then some of the discussion that we'll have uh, in this session, evolving principles to practice and thinking about the use of AI in government. Currently, I am the executive director of a nonprofit organization called uh, the Responsible AI Institute, and what we really focus on is thinking about how we can build tangible tools uh, like visualizations and maps and uh, different types of assessments to help those that are thinking about implementing different types of AI systems into their organization. And so through this, uh, we've had the fortune of working with various different governments, um, but also different types of industry and really seeing that there's not a huge distinction when we're all kind of in this space of maturing and thinking about the impact that AI systems have on our organizations. And through this um, and the work that I did previously with the government of Canada, uh, where I was working on implementing policies for the government of Canada's use of AI systems, really got to understand the both positives of uh, looking to enhance service delivery through the use of AI systems, um, and also just provide better insight into any sort of decision-making systems that we would, or any sort of decisions that we would need to make. Um, but also this started to um, pique my interest and that of many others in thinking about what the potential unintended consequences of these systems could be. And so uh, today we're just going to uh, talk about then the implications that, again, we're seeing both in industry, but really in government um, the use of these systems, and then how uh, we're working tangibly with people like Alka to address uh, those concerns. Uh, over to you, Alka, to introduce yourself. Great. Thanks, Ashley. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Really excited to be here with you all, hopefully next time in person, um, but really uh, appreciate the opportunity uh, to have this conversation with you as well, Ashley. Uh, so just by way of quick introduction, uh, as Ashley said, my name is Alka Patel. I am the Chief of Responsible AI at the Joint Artificial Intelligence Center at the U.S. Department of Defense. Um, two quick pieces of information I think that might be helpful as you hear the rest of the conversation this, this afternoon is um, what is the Joint Artificial Intelligence Center at the DOD? And I think that might be helpful um, as well as just understanding a little bit about my background so you, so you um, have an understanding of the context at which I'm coming to this conversation with. And so uh, starting with my background, uh, I am an engineer, I am a lawyer, I've worked in um, industry, academia, but really uh, a mix of uh, skills from sort of taking a systems engineering approach to thinking through risk or risk management, thinking through what governance and compliance looks like. And I think a number of those skills are really critical for meeting the challenges that Ashley's uh, alluding to and, and we'll be talking about in this conversation. Um, I have the deep privilege of working at the Joint Artificial Intelligence Center at the DOD. And uh, I started this role last year and um, what the, Joint Artificial Intelligence Center, or it's called the Jake. Uh, what the Jake does is really uh, work as a center of excellence within the department to help enable the transformation of the department um, uh, with AI. And so how do we think about uh, adopting, integrating, and scaling AI at an enterprise-wide level? And how do we do it in a responsible manner uh, as we think about these technologies as we're developing them and or procuring them? And so uh, we've had a very um, uh, deep history in in terms of the department and its history and work with respect to ethics and law and policy. And we are building on that as we think about these types of technologies and how do we ensure that we are moving forward in an ethical manner. And so um, I will, I'm happy to share our journey as we go through this conversation. So back to you, Ashley. Perfect, thank you, Alka. Mm -hmm. So just to set the tone for, um, 
really the discussion and the need for we're talking about uh, ethics and really applying this this lens um, to uh, to these different types of AI systems. And one might think that uh, government is there as a service provider, and so there's a lot of different types of logistical things that need to be thought about. And Alka, I'm sure that you can enlighten us as you go through that with um, some of that. I know that when we think of uh, government, we we don't often see all of the back end stuff that's done. Like uh, in Canada, in the Canadian context, uh, a lot of what we were testing um, the use of AI for was the improvement of benefits delivery. Um, but also, we act as a regulator, and so it's really important to also think about the implications that other types of systems might have, and the the rules and guardrails that we start to put around the use of those. And so you can see here um, through some of these examples that um, there's starting to be with the increased use of AI systems, a lot of challenges that can come when they're not implemented in a way that is really thinking about, again, the unintended consequences of those. And so we're seeing where there's disproportionate amounts of um, of potential harm that could be distributed to certain uh, types of community and whether that's through things like um, their ability to apply for loans um, or people of different genders having uh, different types of advertising even sent to them. Um, these become really big significant challenges um, through uh, the Responsible AI Institute or our short version is Ray. Um, we've been collecting several different use cases um, from multiple different jurisdictions. So you can see that uh, on our website, responsible.ai, and then go to uh, products and tools. And within that, we're really trying to track, again, we, we really want to support the adoption, increased use of AI systems, but make sure that we're doing it in a way that is fair and equitable to, uh, um, to all aspects and segments of society. And Elka, um, one thing that I, I know you're gonna get to is um, talking about then the creation of principles that you had within um, the Department of Defense. Uh, and this is something that we were starting to see when um, statistics like this had come out um, throughout both industry and government, just the impact that um, probably is stemming from what people have been uh, people have already been doing and thinking about uh, in relation to the oversight of these systems and trying to put them into a better framework and construct. Um, so with that, can you give a little bit of history into um, the, the Department of Defense's response to some of these challenges that I was just sharing? Sure, happy to, um, and thank you for that. And so, as all of you are seeing on your screen right now, um, what you have in front of you are the DOD AI ethics principles. And I think it might be helpful uh, to share the journey as Ashley had alluded to. Um, so, these principles did not happen overnight, of course, right? It's it's not like we just flipped a switch and here we go, we've got these principles and we're gonna move out on them. But rather it's been a two year journey and that two year journey, actually now maybe you know, even two and a half to three years, um, it started back in 2018 uh, and it's tied to our DOD AI strategy, frankly, which has as one of its five pillars, leading in ethics, leading in military ethics and safety. And so, as I, as I was alluding to at the beginning, the DOD has a strong culture, an existing culture around ethics, given given our mission, given how we are mission driven, this is, this is foundational to the DOD and how it operates. And so it was uh, leadership at that time who recognized that, all right, with emerging technologies such as AI, there is a lot of potential, but then we also need to be thinking about, all right, how, those unintended consequences that actually you were alluding to. And so, they um, asked the Defense Innovation Board, and the Defense Innovation Board is a, a federal advisory committee, and um, they are, are sort of separate uh, but connected, and they are tasked with thinking about how do we catalyze and how do we innovate at the Department of Defense. And so the DIB, or the Defense Innovation Board, was tasked with um, thinking through what should ethics, AI ethics principles look like for the department. And they undertook a 15-month study, and uh, 12 months of those were really meant to be 
inclusive, were inclusive, transparent, and robust in the sense that they did uh, public listening sessions, they did consultative sessions with uh, AI subject matter experts, they did practical exercises with uh, department leaders, they had over um, 10 or 15 meetings with uh, a working group meeting, so bringing stakeholders together in a continuous process to, uh, to engage, and not only uh, were they just defense related, right? These subject matter experts were from all sectors. So academia, industry, civil society, um, they weren't just ethicists or technologists, but they also were uh, lawyers, human rights experts, uh, business leaders, and so forth. And so again, when I, when I um, talk about our principles, I have to give due credit to the Defense Innovation Board, who was instrumental in, in really creating a robust and transparent process to get get to what uh, they finally produced a 80-page um, report in the fall of 2019, which was their recommendations of DODA ethics principles. And so the department then took those recommendations and um, reviewed them and considered them and uh, went through an internal process. And then last year in February 2020, uh, the Secretary of Defense had adopted these AI ethics principles. And while I'm not going to read all of them, I do want to just take a moment because I do think um, they speak to much of what you were trying, what you were suggesting, Ashley, in terms of like, how do we get to some of this? And then I'm really excited to talk about like, all right, how do we take these principles and put them into practice? So um, just for a quick moment. Um, so the first principle is responsible. So requiring that DOD personnel will exercise appropriate levels of judgment and care. And yes, what does that mean? And that is, that is part of of our journey in terms of trying to define that. But I think the critical point that I want to hit home here is that it's DOD personnel, right? So this is everyone's responsibility. This is not just the developers and the coders. Everyone has a responsibility. Um, so from, from the planning and budget folks, to the acquisition folks, to the HR folks, to everyone. Um, equitable, uh, this is obviously one that is near and dear to all of our hearts and, and is one that is talked about um, as, as we see examples and stories in, in, in newspapers and so forth. Um, um, but the fact that we will take deliberate steps to minimize unintended bias. Traceable, I think traceable is um, really twofold here. One is ensuring that uh, the relevant personnel who are working with these technologies have the appropriate understanding of the technology, right? So again, not perhaps just being very, um, not not picking up a technology and, and uh, not understanding the context of how it may operate, how it might be utilized, but really making sure that they have a holistic understanding um, of the technology, the development processes. So what does a workflow look like? Where are potential um, assessment points? What are the operational methods perhaps around testing and evaluation and so forth? And then how are we um, thinking through uh, procedures and methodologies uh, that are transparent and auditable as it relates to the data sources as well as the design procedure, right? So when we talk about bias, not only in terms of the data, but like how are we thinking about bias potentially in our, our design practices? And most of all, how are we documenting this for, for traceability and line of sight across the entire workflow? Uh, with respect to reliable, thinking through safety and security and effectiveness of this capability, right? Going back to um, the integrity of uh, the technical integrity of these capabilities um, for their defined use cases across the entire life cycle. And then governable, how do we um, design, how do we design these technologies um, at the for at, at the very beginning to sort of have a fail safe so that number one, if they are um, uh, acting in a way that they were not intended to act or performing in a way that um, is not consistent with the expectation, there is an ability to turn it off or, or have a fail safe to, to go to plan B. And basically, what is the detection method to uh, identify emergent behavior? So um, I just wanted to kind of give that context of, of what the principles cover. I will say many of these are really grounded in, in good engineering practices, so to speak. But when we talk about responsibility at the department, we know that that's not enough. So talking about the technology is not enough. And so how do we think through the operating um, structures, the incentive structures, as well as the organizational culture, which brings us to the slide, which um, I'm, I'm, you know, as we move in our journey, uh, this slide uh, highlights a memorandum that was issued by uh, the department and signed by the Deputy Secretary of Defense, Dr. Hicks, on May 26. And this memo actually moves us along in this journey in the sense that not only does it reiterate our commitment, the department's commitment to these principles, uh, but it also lays out uh, implementation tenants. So responsible implementation tenants, there's six of them that you see here on the slide. 
And so it's the next step of how do we get from the high level principles to sort of the next piece of what are the critical um, uh, juncture points of where we build our implementation strategy and plan around. And the memo also goes a step further by actually uh, establishing a working council, which includes representatives from across the, de the department, um, as well as uh, specific actions in terms of producing a strategy and implementation plan, um, thinking through talent management, and then thinking through uh, acquisition as well. And so um, I, I feel like that that demonstrates, again, uh, not only does it demonstrate, but it is a form of accountability in the sense of you've got designated individuals with um, assigned uh, uh, um, requirements to, to be met at a certain timeline and, and helps us again, sort of move along this journey. Um, I'll just say real briefly too, in the last year at the Jake, we've had an opportunity to use the Jake as a test bed as we think through our processes, how we think through tools. So actually to your point about uh, what the Response by our Institute does, the tools and the frameworks are really critical. And we do recognize too that they're going to be unique based on the organization, based on the organization's mission, based on the structures and resources. And so um, how do we create what that tool, what the tooling, the, the, the framework uh, looks like for the department? Um, and we're really excited that over the um, uh, last year or so, um, our acquisition uh, area, which is led by our chief of acquisition, uh, Mr. Will Roberts, has been doing amazing work. Um, they are the Jake has issued a number of um, contracting vehicles. So what we've learned, of course, um, at the department, what we know at the department is the fact that a lot of the technologies that we are going to be utilizing, and these technologies are not just for warfighting capacities or, or, or capabilities, but also for back office enterprise type capabilities that you were talking about at the beginning, Ashley. Um, and so what we recognize is that most of these technologies are going to be procured, right? And and at the very beginning, when it comes to these technologies, we don't know all the requirements. And so the DOD actually has to reframe how it does acquisition and think about um, acquisition in an agile perspective. And so um, our chief of acquisition uh, has been working on uh, creating these, uh, we call them OTAs, but these contracting vehicles that allow us to leverage and reach out to a number of industry partners, not just the traditional traditional defense industrial base, which is what folks typically think of, while they are important and critical, we also want to reach out to the startups who are innovating and, and doing some creative work in this space. Um, and, and basically, through some of those vehicles, um, two specifically, one was focused on T&E and one was focused on data. Uh, those are vehicles that allow us to actually operationalize some of those principles and, and helps us move along that journey. Uh, but the one that I think that's gonna be most uh, instrumental and effective is what you see on the screen here uh, with a reference to Project Tradewind, which is where we are going to be um, prototyping a number of our, our uh, responsible acquisition processes, tools, and practices. Um, and I'm happy to go on further, but Ashley, I know I've been talking for a while, so I definitely want to, um, I'll turn it over to you and maybe we can just kind of go back and forth yeah. on the conversation around Tradewind. Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense, Elka, and thank you. And um, we're really excited to be participating in this project. Uh, one of the things that um, I mentioned earlier that the work that I had done in the government of Canada was to build out policy for the use of AI systems. Uh, an important thing, and I think Elka, you would agree with this, is that a policy is, that's just a policy, could sit on a shelf and it's not really that useful. Um, and so it's really important that we find ways through different types of mechanisms or levers that we have in government to actually implement it. And so this theme of like, putting these principles into practice, one could say the same thing, and I'll have a question for you later on this, but just the, um, we we can say, uh, we can have principles, and it's nice to say that we do these things, but how do we measure and how do we evaluate that? Um, and so this idea of operationalizing that, and I think that what's amazing uh, that you were just talking about on the previous slide about um, the Deputy Secretary of Defense actually stepping up and recognizing not only do we have these principles and we're standing by them, but now we need to really look at see how this impacts our operations and what are then the steps that we're going to do. And one of the things that I think is really important too um, that was said in that memo was setting up those levers of accountability. And so going back and having ongoing reporting for this. And so 
in the experience related back to the experience that I had in the government of Canada is um, we had similar types of levers built into the directive on automated decision making systems that I was uh, part of developing. And in addition to that, um, we were really looking at the procurement process. And so we set up um, a, initially a request for information that we were looking at just what is the AI community and vendor landscape. And some of the questions when we had um, a, an initial discussion with a lot of the, the industry and community was asking things like, what do you see the impact of these systems having on society? And that really helped us to shape our understanding of then what does um, responsible grounded in human rights mean to us? And one of the things that um, then evolved when we went into creating a supply list for pre-qualified AI vendors was then actually assessing them against not just their competency and not just their capacity to deliver a project, which is really important, but also their ability to do that in a responsible manner. And one of the things that we were really looking for when we did this evaluation was an actual action plan or commitment that's demonstrating that they're capable of doing that, not just saying, oh yeah, we think ethics is important. We think respecting human rights is important. Really trying to get to assess what do you mean by this? And so with this experience and then with the work that we're doing um, through Ray, we're really excited to kind of continue that journey um, through Tradewind. And Elka, you spoke about um, t &E being um, uh, testing and evaluation and some of the other types of prototypes that Tradewind's done. I think, um, again, in the same, a similar sort of spirit to what the government of Canada did, and I, and I see lots of governments trying to really come to um, figure out how they need to make some changes in their processes throughout, um, whether that's um, developing policy in the open or whether that's really shifting how we do procurement. Um, do you see how Tradewind is, um, and with its agility, trying to um, respond to some of those challenges that we might have with procuring something like AI that, again, has these responsibility challenges potentially, but also is a technology that's changing so quickly and uh, the government would want to stay on top of? Yeah, I know that's a great question. And I think that is uh, part of our journey and, and part of the work that, that lies ahead of us. But I do think there are a couple points that I'll highlight um, and welcome your thoughts as, as well on this. Um, but uh, I think, um, and I would do wanna go back for one quick second um, <laughs> on something that you said, I think that is really important in terms of some of your, your prior experiences um, in terms of having industry partners or vendors think through how are they doing responsible AI? And so in these, the the &E and the data uh, contracting vehicle that I mentioned, um, I think it's really important uh, that, well, I will share that, like we, we went down that path as well and we put in requirements that you should have a quality control plan and a quality, and, and these are like DOD terms, but basically effectively the same sort of concept. Um, and I, I just wanna point out too, like we are really sensitive to the fact that, you know, um, smaller organizations don't necessarily have all the resources that large organizations have, right? So like, as we create these, um, uh, think about these processes, uh, how do we do it in a way that is still inclusive and recognizes that, you know, um, we, we wanna bring everyone to a table, but in a way that works for everyone and satisfies our requirements as well. Um, so going back to the trade wind aspect, um, I think there's going to be a number of opportunities. The one that I will highlight that, that, that is near and dear to my heart is on the education piece. Um, I, I think education is really critical. Uh, I see this within, frankly, I'm sure this happens with a number of organizations where, um, you know, we're using words, but we don't necessarily use them in the same way or in the same context. And so like, how do we, um, how do we get on the same page? And actually what I would say too, is that many of these organizations may have their own principles as well. And so how do we sort of um, educate our industry partners on what we are looking for? What does, what do our principles mean to us? What type of uh, processes are we expecting to be able to operationalize? And so oftentimes there's a conversation around technical interoperability but I think we need to just figure out our practices when we're working with vendors, what does an interoperability aspect look like? Um, but the education piece I think is going to be critical and I think there's gonna be uh, different um, 
sort of uh, stages of education that can be incorporated within the trade wind. So as people enter into into uh, trade wind, there's potentially an initial stage, and then and then you build off of that. Um, I think there's also an opportunity here to do some. Um, uh, maturity assessment aspect. So one thing I will share with you is that uh, even within the DOD, right, we have a number of different services and, and I would uh, say that's akin to business lines within an, organ an industry organization, right? There are different levels of maturity within the DOD and, and how do we get everyone on the same page? And so similarly, when we're working with our vendors, you know, I kind of say that whatever we need to be doing vertically within our organization, we need to be doing horizontally across with our industry partners. And so how do we think about that maturity assessment? Um, what kind of tools do we need to be able to track that, to identify potential gaps so that we can then mitigate the risks? Um, and or potentially uh, are there ways to create opportunities for teaming within um, different types of organizations that, that can help each other to get to the, the expected or intended outcome? Um, at the end, but Ashley, I know you, you're, been yeah, no, I think it's a good, well. yeah. And I think one thing just before we move on, cause I, I do want to talk about the, uh, that assessment piece, but I, um, one thing that's interesting about trade win that I think we didn't highlight is that it is, um, a member driven, uh, like the OTA that I know sometimes, especially in government, we tend to use these acronyms, um, but it's an other task authorization, which again, doesn't even explain too much, but the idea is that it's this prototype space to be able to bring multiple different um, types of organizations together um, and individuals, if I understand correctly as well, Elka, to try and um, help uh, advance a lot of these different initiatives. And through that, there'll be um, several different uh, vehicles and, and contracts and RFIs, et cetera, that will come out through that. Yeah, and a great point, probably should have spent a little bit more time. <laughs> no, no, no. My, my apologies for that, uh, for any confusion. And on the OTAs, for any of you who may be familiar with US uh, government <laughs> contracting, um, it will be a breath of fresh air compared to our FARs and our regulatory requirements. So our OTA basically allows us to um, come up with other ways to, to do acquisition without having to go through um, a very rigid process, uh, which doesn't work for, for AI type uh, capabilities. But in any event, so Tradewind is uh, intended to be this consortia where we bring together, as you said, Ashley, we bring together uh, a number of industry partners um, and um, uh, create this community Community, frankly, internally, mm -hmm. and that community can then um, be accessed by our internal DOD partners. So uh, the, the various services, the Jake, um, and so forth. And so they have a place to go to 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 connect with uh, commercial um, entities that are leading innovation in, in in the space and can help them assist uh, meeting their their needs as well. So um, I think this consortia, as it um, builds and grows, uh, we'll have other capabilities as well. And so the matching concept that I had mentioned is perhaps, you know, are there opportunities to engage and connect even two uh, industry partners together to get to a final end result? Yeah. Or is there an opportunity to have um, sort of subject matter expert consultation groups uh, or, or mini ad advisory groups, so to speak? And um, is there an opportunity here to like build a, a community of subject matter experts, especially when we're talking about responsible AI? One of the yeah. things that I hear across the department, frankly, um, and, and I don't think this is unique to the DOD, right? I think this is something that all organizations are, are working uh, towards, which is how do we ensure that we have the skills capacity uh, to really be able to do responsible AI and how do we sort of thread that needle? And so perhaps um, through Tradewind, by bringing all of these communities together, industry, academia, and defense, like there could be opportunities um, for, for leveraging some of that engagement. Yeah, and you're right. It's definitely not unique to the um, to DoD. We've seen this with many different types of um, both governments and then also organizations. But just again, in my experience uh, with when we were doing the request for information leading into the now this uh, creation of a an invitation to qualify, so a pre qualified list of vendors. Uh, just that idea of how do you get subject matter experts to work together um, is quite interesting. And it's not typical for companies to um, that might not know each other to bid on a contract together. And so to be the facilitator of that, and one of the things I can't believe neither of us have mentioned yet 
is when we're talking about AI, typically this is my initial go-to, is it's so many different things. And I don't want to get into a discussion about the definition of it, but that was actually where I was going to go with the question on the principles is that it's nice to say all of these things, but in practice, when you are talking about technologies, many technologies that go across many different types of systems and whether that be, uh, and programs, so whether that be operational or whether that be um, uh, services that you need to deliver, that body of knowledge and expertise, like there's not just one organization that knows right. how to do all AI. No, I, such an excellent point. Um, and, and it's it's funny because that resonates quite a bit as I just, we were, we were making that point internally um, uh, yesterday uh, in a meeting in terms of there isn't just one body and, and it goes back to like, it's not just one responsibility, but then how do you organize within an enterprise to be able to, to ensure that you've covered all of those different areas, right? Um, yeah. And as we were talking to Ashley, it reminded me of, of something else that I think it, uh, bears mentioning is that um, when I was referring to the education piece, not only is it important uh, in terms of um, understanding uh, the concerns around uh, these technologies, understanding how they might produce these unintended uh, effects and so forth, there's a, there's a whole other conversation that needs to be happening around how are we doing appropriate knowledge sharing and knowledge transfer from the developers to the end users. And that is something we are thinking very deeply about in terms of um, how how do we communicate that information in a way that the user can can understand that is not so technical but it has enough information and context so they know how a system or a capability may uh, function in a certain context when they can and cannot trust it um, and so how, you know that knowledge transfer I think is going to be a critical piece and especially when we're thinking about um, high risk situations when there isn't enough time to be able to digest and think through okay does should i should i not right um do, do i utilize this capability or not and so i think that's an important piece and then ultimately um just circling back and i'm i'm not sure if we um went down this path too is is um how do our warfighters how do our, our individuals within the dod trust these capabilities and trust is i know is has many many levels <laughs> and different um definitions and many different um understandings but but ultimately um we could have the best technology in the world and if our end user doesn't trust that capability to actually use it then you know what good was that? And so I think um, kind of going back to sort of all of these points that we've been making, and, and I think this is perfect for you to, to um, pick up from here uh, with the slide here, but is how do we connect the threads across all yeah. of these pieces? How do we develop and build that trust? Um, and then how do we basically take that and, and um, have it scaled within an enterprise? So I'll turn it over to you on that one. No, thank you. And that's completely it. And one of the um, just maybe I'll go back really quick is um, one of the things that we did as an institute, I guess, coming from the government, uh, it was really nice where I had uh, an opportunity to do something again. And when you do something the second time, uh, you get to you have the power of uh, hindsight and uh, how would you do that in a in a slightly different way and the nice thing is that um, a lot of these themes that we're talking about and even now through this conversation I can go back and say okay well we did this and this was a good aspect of it um, but there's a lot of lessons learned too and so um, similar to the principal work that you had done uh, one of the things we did when I um, when got started with Ray was did a mapping of your principles of uh, the IEEE's ethical line design, uh, the Ask Lomar principles, but also um, principles that companies like Google, Microsoft, et cetera, were, were publishing um, and really wanted to understand the common threads with all of those. So just in terms of um, some of the discussions we've been having, our framework um, for really thinking about that question that you had, Alka, which is like, how do you move to the next thing? How do you take those principles and how do you build some sort of evaluation against that? And whether that be for procurement or whether that be for 
um, some type of policy compliance. Um, that's what we're really, really thinking about. Um, ultimately, what we want to do as an organization is create a certification mark, but we know that in order to get there, we need to really think in practical terms with people like Elka and other community members to really understand okay, when we say we want good data quality or robustness, um, even what you were talking about in terms of what does trust mean? Trust could be, do I trust that my system is going to work and it's accurate? But accuracy might not be, like, it might be a trade-off we need to make between, okay, it could harm someone, um, similar to the conversation I was having earlier. So what we've done is, um, and are looking through this Tradewinds initiative, Tradewind initiative to apply to some of these um, these different types of use cases um, with Elka is really look at how do we build um, a similar type of assessment. So looking at um, those assessment categories, which again is a culmination of best practices, uh, really aligned with the um, the work that many have done in this space. And then thinking about it through um, an AI system really being about having data components. So these inputs that are feeding and training um, the model and um, then the model itself, that's the, the calculation of the of what gets to, what needs to be done and not done. Uh, and then ultimately the context in which that is. And Elka, I'm sure that um, this is something that you have internal conversations about, but um, just even thinking about, again, like basic AI, like RPA and um, using it for supply chain, I'm sure that's different based on um, all of the different bases that you have across the country, let alone the world. And so it's interesting um, context and again, how that data and model are then trained and deployed. Um, so I don't know if you want to to speak to that, but uh, how how do you see um, leveraging tools um, and, and assessment type tools in order to get to the outcome of taking your principles and really trying to uh, evaluate systems against those? Yeah, no, I'll just share briefly here. Um, as I know, I think we're coming up on time, but um, I think they're going to be critical. I and what I what I do think is um, I don't want folks to walk away thinking that the tools the tools in and in and of themselves are the final answer for for operationalizing the principles, but they are critical. They are critical to helping us on that path and journey, right? Um, and I think as we uh, think about documentation, as we think about frankly using the tools as ways to prompt the right conversation, mm -hmm. using the tools to um, engage different individuals around the table is really where we get the value of the tools. And of course, the the, the, the output is, is important as well for, for a number of other um, uh, reasons. But I think the tools, um, you know, have the function of, of um, ensuring or at least helping uh, the prompts for the for those conversations are necessary across the entire life cycle. So mm -hmm. I don't know that um, there's one tool and you're going to use just that one tool and it's going to cover all your bases. But I think a tool that covers the different components, as, as you've stated here with the data and the model and the context, and one that is reevaluated and reassessed and, and reviewed continually is, is going to be critical. And, and I think practitioners in this area are going to need something like this to help them. Um, and I think too, it's going to, you know, when when people who are not in the space are trying to understand what the space looks like, you know, I get the question, what exactly is responsible AI? And so having a tool to kind of frame that conversation is obviously important as well, but, but I'll leave it at that for now. No, thank you. Okay, I was gonna say uh, we can talk about this, and we do <laughs> um, for for a long time. Um, but I'm super, super happy to uh, work with you and other community members that are thinking critically about how to actually go beyond the principal discussions. Like I think that there was um, problem definition setting. Uh, in like 2018, 2019, and a lot of outcry about the, some of these challenges, then we got into, okay, well, there's principles as you articulated with having multi-stakeholder groups to, to really think through what those implications could be, but it was in such a generic sense. And I really appreciate how now we're getting into, okay, how do we actually apply this? So uh, thank you so much for being here and part of this discussion today.